Good morning, Carrie Lee here from the Sacred Cedars Wilderness School, and I'm here to share a little bit of backstory on episode eight of Alone Season Nine. And the first thing I want to talk about is burping. <laughs> Oops, excuse me. So we saw Jesse and JP out there, and they were both having experiencing a lot of belching and some tummy issues, and JP, Juan Pablo, lost his appetite. And I just want to say that I was experiencing the same thing too. I had a lot of belching. And for me, it started after I ate the very first squirrel. And I thought that was kind of weird. And maybe there's something up with that squirrel. And I was a little leery at first. But then it kept going and going. It just became part of my everyday life. So I decided not to worry about it. And there's really nothing I could do about it. So I just accepted it as that that's part of what my digestive system needs to do in order to keep rolling like that. The second thing I want to talk about is water. And I found it interesting that Terry's water turned white because of the tannins in the water and my water turned black. And even when in the early days when I was collecting rainwater off of my tarp, my water would turn black. And at first I thought maybe it was the cast iron or maybe I'm just eating too many blueberries, but I stopped eating blueberries for a whole week just to see if that's would change because the water was turning my teeth black. That was pretty obvious. And I was really concerned about my water being black and if whatever's causing my water to turn black and it's staining my teeth, what is it doing to my organs? So that was really, really concerning me. And it took me a long time to figure out what it was. And yes, cooking the berries down does strip the cast iron and then I have to reseason it with the fats from the animals that I'm trying to eat, which is, a little bit of waste of fat, but I had to do it. However, I had to narrow it down. In the mornings, I was making raspberry tea with Labrador tea, and in the night, I was making spruce tea. My water would turn black with the raspberry and Labrador. So one day, I tried it with just the raspberry leaf tea, and it was the raspberry, some kind of chemical reaction with the cast iron, that was what turned my water black. And that was really unfortunate because I was relying on that raspberry leaf because raspberry has calcium that an older woman needs for your bones. And it has the potassium and some sodium that helps keep you rehydrated. So I was really, really needing that herb. So unfortunately, I had to come up with a different way to make tea or stop drinking the raspberry leaf tea, of which I did for quite a while. However, I still got these stained black teeth and it was really bothering me because here I am on national TV ah, and I have black teeth and I look like a meth head. I was like, oh, this is horrible. Not that that's going to stop me from doing what I'm doing, but it was horrible in my mind. <laughs> so as you see me on episode eight, I found some horsetail, some dried horsetail at that point. It was all, there was no green horsetail left. And I grinded it up. I dried it out, grinded it up, and made a tooth powder. And I was fascinated about how well that worked. Like one brushing made a huge difference and two or three brushings even more so. So I tried to brush my teeth with that powder every day from there on out. And that really, really saved my pride a little bit, I just have to say. <laughs> so, but I just find that interesting of why raspberry leaf in conjunction with cast iron would, would do that. On the show, they made it look like my teeth were turning black because of the berries. And that really was not the case. It was the raspberry leaf tea. And I'm sure the berries definitely stained my, my mouth blue. <laughs> but you know, good for me, I got some good blueberries in. So now let's talk about the muskrat. This was a highlight of my experience out there. I loved, loved, loved the muskrats and I became very obsessed by them. They would swim around along my shore while I was fishing all the time. Like they didn't really care who I was. I wasn't the threat to them. And I kept thinking, like, how am I gonna get these muskrats without losing my bow or my arrow or having to dive into the water? So I devised this muskrat contraption. And at first I had my floating line for my fly fishing gear on the reel attached to my bow. And so my idea was that when I pulled the bow, the floating line was tethered to an arrow. So when I shot, then the reel would release the line and I, bingo, I would get my animal. So I tried that and my first attempt, a huge, huge grandfather muskrat came on shore four feet away from my feet and I'm like, oh my God, there it is. So I pulled, made my shot, bing, and the line went 
the arrow went and I missed the muskrat by two inches. And I was so like, oh, no way. So that slack of the line got hung up on the bow and it, I missed my shot. So then I had to like, okay, that was try number one. Try number two, let's get the Y stick. So on the Y stick, I was able to have a stationary place for the reel, but the con of that is that when you pull the slack out, now the line can get tangled up in the grass and maybe some little willow branches that are sticking up. And that is actually what you see me doing. I am stringing out my line and getting it untangled from a willow branch. And while I'm doing that, lo and behold, there's a muskrat. And no, I did not see that until I looked up like, oh, there it is. So then once I stood up and by the time I could get in a position, he was gone. But no avail, I know they're gonna be back. They're there almost every day. So I waited for a couple hours till the sun set before I aborted my mission and tried, tried again. And as you see on the next attempt, I went down there and again, only I was at a different spot. I found the muskrat den. It was just a little bit upstream and on a, what I called the muskrat bar. So there was the river, a little hump in the land that I called the bar and then a, a lagoon. And the muskrats would go up and over this bar to get to the lagoon and their den was underneath. I found a huge, huge rock with the entrance into their den. So I was like, score, I'm just gonna sit here. And so I did, and that's where I set my reel up and I waited and waited. And it didn't take very long when a muskrat came up on the shore again. So bingo, I don't even have to aim into the water. And so I took my shot and you see me diving underneath this willow bush, which was really low branches. And to tell you the truth, it's hard to tell what I'm doing. And it's hard for me to tell you what I'm doing because I had just washed my hair, I didn't have it in braids, and I was underneath this willow branch and it was, my hair was tangled like this and I couldn't see. And that arrow went through right below its spine. And this has got a big, thick spine. I was amazed how thick those spines were. And it kind of penetrated, but went through a rib or got stopped. It didn't make the kill, unfortunately. So I'm underneath this branch, but when I got there, what happened is the muskrat had tumbled and I don't even know where my arrow is at this point, but the, the line, my fishing line was wrapped around its body. So I pulled it down and I had it pinned with a branch, kind of humped over a branch. It's like, okay, I got him pinned, but then he's squirming around and trying to get back in the water. And I'm like, you know, don't bite me. And I did not want to have a repeat of what Nikki went through in season six. So I was, I was having those visions though. I was like, I need to get my knife, but my knife is in my Velcro cargo pocket on my pants and it's inside a Leatherman sheath, which is also Velcro. So I tried to get it out and I, he started squirming. So I think it was a five minute battle. They made it look really easy and like it happened in 30 seconds. It was not, it was a battle. And so I had him pinned down and eventually I was able to get my knife out of the pocket and I was able to dispatch him. But like I said, my hair was like this. And you can see that when I came out, I was like, I got my muskrat. <laughs> and through all that, yes, you can still see my black teeth. In fact, I think I said that. I was like, I got a muskrat. Oh shit, look at my teeth. Uh. <laughs> so that was a very intense, intense moment. But I have to say that I was so grateful for that muskrat. It fed me for three days. Next, you see me back at camp and I'm cooking up my prize muskrat and I skinned it, I case skinned it. And I also took the scent sack and I hung it in a bush because in case I might want to do something crazy with it, I don't know, but I left it there. And you see me roasting the legs of the muskrat, but you also see the rest of the muskrat in the background. And what I tended to do, you always want to boil your meat because then you get all the fats but there's really not any fat in the legs. So just to get that yummy smoke flavored, crunchy, you know, barbecue grilled taste, I would roast the legs and that would be my dinner. It was just a light meal for dinner. So I took the rest of the muskrat and put it in my pot and cooked it and saved it for breakfast. And the reason why I did that is I would try to eat my food in the mornings because according to Chinese medicine, you have most of your energy is in your stomach at breakfast time between 7 to 9 a.m. From 7 to 9 p.m., you have the least amount of energy in your stomach. 
And so I want to take advantage of where my energy is in my body and not be eating late at night. And I want to eat early in the morning because now my body doesn't have to work so hard to absorb all those calories. So I was playing that, but I had to roast the legs and treat myself because, ah, I got, I got my meat, <laughs> you know? So to me, that was just an appetizer, although it was a meal. Those were pretty big legs, I just have to say. Three or four times bigger than a squirrel. And then in the morning, I would enjoy the rest of the body and I saved the brains for last. And I was kind of disappointed that they didn't show me eating the brains of any of those animals because that was the best part. In the head, especially in the muskrat, you have all these fat glands around the neck and in the mouth and the jaw and all these cheek muscles and the tongue is loaded with fat. And the best of all is the brains. So I would have tanned that hide with the brains. However, my body needed the fat of the brains way much more. So I still have that pelt here at home and I will be tanning it. So I'll keep you posted on what I end up doing with it. But while I was out there, I tried to think of different purposes I could use it for. I really had everything I needed. So we'll see what comes of that. So I caught the muskrat about four days before Halloween. So of course you see me after I've boiled all the bones down and made my bone broth, I made those glasses out of the pelvic bones and made my hair into little ears and painted my face up. And I don't know if you remember in 1972, if you were alive, you might remember the Captain and Sunil Muskrat love song. So of course I've got that song in my head. Muskrat Susie, Muskrat Sam, do the jitterbug in Muskrat land in the evening. Of course, I couldn't remember all the words while I was out there, but I had that song in my head for days. I was like, okay, Halloween's coming. I gotta do this skit. So of course I got Muskrat Sam and I'm Muskrat Susie. And I kind of play out that song because I knew it was a love song and they meet and then they're snuggling or they're wiggling and they're doing nose kisses. And they didn't show all of the skit, but what really happens is Sam thinks Susie's pretty cute, but Susie's little teeth keep sliding apart and had these big gaps on her teeth. So he asked her out on a date anyway and wanted to meet at the big river at midnight and do a little swim in and she accepted, but she said she had to go to the orthodontist first to get her teeth fixed because they kept sliding apart. <laughs> so he missed that part. They filmed the part where the teeth were actually still staying together. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun doing that and I hope you enjoyed watching it. It was a really nice way, I thought, to honor the animal because it is Halloween and that is when we honor our ancestors. And that includes the ancestors of the land and that's why we dress up at Halloween. And for All Saints Day, that's a very popular holiday, especially in Mexico, where people dress up as their ancestors in order to honor them. If you were not alive in 1972 and don't remember the song that I'm talking about, here is the link to a YouTube video that I found of Captain and Tennille singing it with their beautiful Tennille hairdo. <laughs> I think I had my hair like that way back when. So it's just a really cute video and just silly and you know, it's all about love. And yes, I forgot to say, the muskrat at first I said it tasted a lot like beaver, but after I ate more of it, it actually tasted like roasted duck. It was so good. And I wondered why, why don't we eat that when we trap them here? And why don't we sell this in stores? Why does everybody think muskrat tastes musky or something? But it was really, really good. And I became addicted. And I went down to the river every day after that, trying to get another one. So stay tuned to see what happens. And we'll see you for episode nine. Have a great day. Ciao for now.